Support for this program is provided by the men and women of the Louisiana Forestry Association. Through sustainable forestry, LFA members promote the health and productivity of Louisiana's forests for generations to come. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Hello and welcome to Louisiana Public Square. I'm Kirby Goodell, director of LSU's Public Policy Research Lab. A famous frog once said, it's not easy being green, but Kermit might be singing a different tune today. Through generous tax incentives and stimulus programs that encourage energy conservation, efficiency, and alternative energy use, being green, especially in Louisiana, has become much simpler. Rising gasoline prices and unrest in the Middle East have sparked a renewed interest in seeking alternative sources of fuel. Pushing for more investment in clean and renewable energy, President Obama said in his State of the Union address that this is our generation's Sputnik moment. So where is Louisiana in this technological journey? Are clean energy breakthroughs translating into clean energy jobs? And how are Louisiana citizens living green? These dials uh, show me how much power I'm making currently. Uh, these are my two inverters. Uh, this dial shows the total of the two inverters. I'm currently making 5.08 kilowatts. Sally Holloway is using her personal computer to monitor the performance of the solar system she installed on her Alexandria home. Uh, this graph shows me um, my historical usage today. Um, and you can see as it starts to go negative, that's where I'm selling power back to the city. Sally has seen her electricity costs cut in half thanks to the state requirement that utility companies buy back any power generated by a solar system. Anytime during the day, for instance, if it's bright and sunny, I'll, I'll be making more energy than I'm using. And at that point, uh, my meter actually starts turning backwards and the power that I'm not using, that I'm making more than I'm using, is sent back to the grid and I get credit for that uh, on my bill at the end of the month. Sally is one of the state's 1,100 citizens who have taken advantage of Louisiana's solar and wind tax credit since it was offered in 2008. The credit is the most generous of its kind in the country. When combined with federal incentives, homeowners can save up to 80 percent on the cost of a solar system. The total amount individuals claimed from the state tax credit rose from $1.8 million in 2008 to more than $8.5 million a year later. Without the state tax credit and the federal uh, tax credit, uh, I wouldn't have been able to afford it at all. Through tax credits and incentive programs, Louisiana is making it easier for more and more residents and businesses to make lifestyle and business choices that qualify as green. Defining green, it's, it's generally activities that, uh, that benefit the environment and conserve natural resources. Deck Terrell is the director of LSU's Division of Economic Development, which is partnering with the Louisiana Workforce Commission in a regional green jobs survey. Part of his work with the Growing Green Project has been defining the state's green economic sector. So you look at things like greenhouse gas reduction, you look at pollution reduction, you look at a lot of different areas of the economy and a lot of different activities and, and try to determine whether these would qualify as green or not. While the project has developed seven categories for green activities, a lot of movement across the state has recently been in renewable and alternative energy. There is the Blade Dynamics Wind Turbine Factory in New Orleans, the Point Bioenergy Wood Pellet Plant in Baton Rouge, and the Novalite Lithium Battery Facility in Zachary. Free Flow Power has also received preliminary permits to submerge turbines in the Mississippi and Atchafalaya Rivers to generate power from their currents. Last year, the Louisiana Public Service Commission approved a pilot program to encourage utility companies to provide over 12 percent of their electricity from alternative sources by 2020. I think another good approach to that pilot is using market forces to find out what the best renewable energy is out there. 
David Dismukes is with the LSU Center for Energy Studies. He says that unlike other states that set targets in specific sectors, such as solar, the Louisiana program won't have a so-called portfolio standard. They're not going in and self-selecting one resource or another. They're putting everybody into the mix, requiring them to bid, and taking the least cost resources. Responding to an increased supply of natural gas from formations such as the Haynesville Shale, the state is making it easier to access the cleaner burning fuel. Christopher Knotts helps to oversee Empower Louisiana, a portfolio of programs that target greener activities through rebates and grants. We should be a leader in the alternative fuel refueling network and the transportation program did that. It built out uh, several stations in areas of the state where we didn't have any before. Through Empower Louisiana, new compressed natural gas filling stations are opening in Shreveport, Bossier City, Alexandria, Lafayette, and Baton Rouge. Knotts says the rebate programs for energy efficiency have been equally successful. The uh, Energy Star rebate program was one that we had $6.4 million and it was open to the, all the citizens of Louisiana. In seven days, 32,000 citizens had reserved all $6.4 million. Energy efficiency is also a big part of a growing green construction movement in the state called LEAD, or Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. It's the indoor air quality, it's your positioning of the building so that you have traffic, foot traffic, uh, you know, hopefully you can incorporate bicycle paths, uh, water reuse is a big thing, and also the materials that you put inside the building. Bruce Hoffman is chairman of the Louisiana chapter of the U.S. Green Building Council, which developed the LEED certification system. Bolstered by the rebuilding efforts following Hurricane Katrina, Hoffman says over 40 LEED certified buildings can now be found all over the state. ConAgra's sweet potato processing plant in Delhi received LEED Platinum certification for, among other things, its energy efficiency. Hoffman says LEED also makes sense for municipalities. Shreveport, for instance, spends about a million dollars a month in their utility costs of water and wastewater treatment service, utilities. If we can reduce that by 60 percent, that's $600,000 a month that they can use for their infrastructure for their rebuilding purposes, for economic development. I mean, that, that's, that's what this is all about. For Brenda Nixon, a 10-year veteran with the Governor's Commission on Environmental Education, living green isn't about the money. I think it's the right thing to do. Nixon drives an electric gasoline hybrid car that bears the state's environmental vanity license plate she helped to establish. Using a self-generating battery, the car delivers up to 50 miles a gallon. Nixon's decision to purchase it was based on a desire to conserve resources and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Even if you don't believe in global warming, we have lots of climate change happening. And uh, fossil fuels are definitely fueling it, in my opinion. No matter how you define it, Nixon says being green is ultimately in all our best interests. Think about it, Texas, for example, often is the cause of why we have some of the pollution that we have here. I mean, it just comes right in. We're, you know, we're all exchanging the same air and, the, and using up the same resources. So I think that's why, I, you know, we just need to sort of think twice. What's the best thing for, for me and for the environment as well? Joining me to talk green is our studio audience. They include Baton Rouge area residents who were randomly recruited and surveyed for us by LSU's Public Policy Research Lab. We also have a master student from LSU and a member of the Baton Rouge Clean Cities Co Coalition joining us. Reviewing some of the survey questions. When asked how, where they would rank preserving the environment given the state's current economic conditions, 76% of those surveyed said very important. 19% said somewhat important, and 5% said not very important. Asked to rate the importance of retailers offering more environmentally friendly products, even if more expensive, half of those surveyed, 50%, said very important, 27% said somewhat important, and a total of 21% rated the idea as neither not very or not at all important. 
When asked if people should be encouraged to drive cars that use sources other than gasoline, such as electricity or biofuels, 47% feel this is very important, 33% think the idea is somewhat important, while 18% found it either not very or not at all important. And when asked how much current Louisiana policies are doing to preserve the state's natural resources, 61% said not enough. 32% were unsure, 6% feel current policies are adequate, while 2% feel current policies do more than enough to preserve Louisiana's resources. So we see a lot of support for wanting to preserve the environment. But what does that actually mean? What does being green mean to you? And what does it mean to talk about a green Louisiana? Glenn, what does being green mean to you? Well, I think it means um being mindful of my daily activities and the resources I'm using, as well as uh, thinking about uh, my purchases as a consumer, trying to uh, uh, make the right choices. Okay. Wanda, what does being green mean to you? Being green uh, to me means uh, also to make um, mindful uh, decisions uh, about what we're doing, uh, how we're do uh, and how we're doing uh, the things that we do to uh, conserve energy, uh, to uh, improve the environment, and also to make the necessary changes in, in our lifestyles that we, meet, we need to make in order to become even more green. Paul, would you, uh, would you agree with that definition? Not at all. Okay, why not? Let me ask you a question. How many electric cars you see running up and down a highway? The reason you don't see that many is Nobody, everybody wants to go green. It's, you know, it's like being politi political, politically correct. Everybody wants to go green, change this and change that. You know what? Nobody ever talks about the exorbitant cost associated with going green. Um, Marcel, are you willing to pay extra, extra money for green products, green services? Yes, I am because I'm really concerned with chemicals and other things that go into my household for my pets and my family, <coughs> so I would. Okay. What, what about you, Jackie? Well, I'm concerned about the chemicals, too, and so I bought a steamer with a nice tank in it, and I clean my house with that steamer. Another thing I'm terribly concerned about is water, how much water we use. From the time I turn on my hot, wa my hot water tap until water comes out of the tap is 47 seconds. That's too long. I have called plumbing companies and asked them if they could help me do something about getting that hot water there quicker. They're no help at all. Aaron, do you worry when you, if you're thinking about green products, do you worry that maybe they're not as good, maybe the quality isn't as high, maybe it's just a marketing gimmick? Uh, I do worry, um, but I also try to do a little research in those areas to, to see if those kinds of products um, match up with the sort of products I'm used to buying. Um, but I'd, I'd also like to address the, the thing about going green costing extra. I think that there are a lot of ways to go green that don't cost at all. Reusing plastic bags, right. for instance. Um, uh, is something that doesn't cost at all. Turning off electric, um, you know, you know the, the TV or something, things like that, um, doesn't cost anything at all. Walking or biking instead of taking your car doesn't mm -hmm. cost anything at all. So I think that when you're looking at personal responsibility and going green, it doesn't necessarily have to cost extra. Um, so that particular point for me um, is definitely something that's, that's up for debate in terms of personal responsibility and the cost of going green. Yes. Danielle, you, you're shaking your head. Do you think we have a civic responsibility, a personal responsibility to make sure we're conserving resources? I absolutely do. And um, for the sake of the future, I believe that it's important that we do that. Um, I think that we've gotten away from um, the past where people did conserve resources because we didn't have a lot of money. And nowadays, we're able to buy new products all the time, you know, and uh, that's wasteful. Robert, what about you in terms of in terms of conserving resources? You think it's a civic responsibility? Yeah, absolutely. I agree with the comment before about water. A lot of people don't realize just what a precious resource our particular water supply is here in the Baton Rouge area. It's extremely unique. Uh, it's a very uh, high quality groundwater resource and we should be doing everything we can to make sure that our grandchildren and great-grandchildren have all of that water that they need. 
Karen, Karen now, um, have you taken other steps? Do you feel like you're doing more now in terms of in terms of trying trying to conserve resources? Is, are, are you more conscious of, of green activities? Absolutely. Uh, I did take the plunge and buy uh, a green car. Mm -hmm. um, one of the ways that you can help with your water issue, uh, if you need to replace your water heater, you might want to consider looking into the tankless water heaters where you have hot water on demand. I have one of those as well. But I, I agree, it's not just the investment that we make in the environment, which if you can make it, it's a great thing. There really are ways that you can have a positive impact that don't cost anything. Uh, bringing your own reusable bags to a grocery and yeah. you know, just contributing in small ways, it all adds up. Now, so far we're talking sort of about personal responsibility. What's the responsibility of government, of state government and local government? Lauren, do you have? Well, I think personal responsibility is really what comes to mind when people think about what green means. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to corporate social responsibility, it falls in the realm of the concept of sustainable development. And I think it's interesting to note how the investments that industry and government make can really develop markets and increase the scale that will allow for product prices to become lower and become more available for the general public. Now a lot of, a lot of people will say, uh, a lot of people in our survey said government's not doing enough. Doris, do you think government's doing enough? Well, it's a now reading and, you know, studying and being more interested in what's going on. Um, the uh, materials that was given to me, mm -hmm. I, I thought they wasn't, mm -hmm. but you know, checking and uh, computer and look, looking around, taking up you know, all the technology and, and reading on, I think they are. Mm -hmm. I think they're doing more in Louisiana than I thought they were. Mm -hmm. Because I always thought, you know, we wasn't doing enough, but mm -hmm. it seems that we are. Um, Joy, do you yeah. think government, is government doing enough? The only thing I have an issue with, with the government getting involved, is that they should get involved more in education of young children. It's got to start at the beginning, like computers started with children. And I don't think they're taught enough. Remember, we cleaned up the roadsides mm -hmm. with all the cute little ads that they did. Mm -hmm for years and years and years not to litter. And that was an easy thing to do, but it does have to start with young people and reverse older people's thinking about consuming too much. Now, now government can regulate or they can provide tax incentives and try to encourage cer certain types of behavior. Marceau, do you have a preference there? Would you rather see I government? I would love more tax incentives for the yeah. consumer yeah. as well as businesses that come in to make sure everything is safe. Mm -hmm. Like with the cars, I would love to have a car that would get 50 miles to the gallon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's what I'll be doing next. Yeah, Paul. That's my point. Everybody wants a car that gets 50 miles to the gallon. <laughs> God, goodness gracious, who doesn't with gas hovering to four dollars a gallon? How much is that car gonna cost to get $50 a gallon? Ask California about their green program. California's in bankruptcy because they, and I'm not anti-green, I know it sounds like I'm anti-green, I'm, I'm, I'm really not anti-green, I'm being a realist here. Mm -hmm. The cost associated, you wanna bring your bags to the grocery store and reuse them, I applaud you, I think it's great, okay? But on the other hand, I'm in the construction industry and all this leads and all this green stuff, it adds significantly to the cost. Your tankless hot water heater costs you probably $1,500. A regular hot water heater costs you $150. How long is it going to take you to recoup the 10 times more you paid for a tankless hot water heater? That's, that's my point. It's the economics of going green. It sounds wonderful, okay, but there's a significant cost associated with going green. And that, that's my point. And you, would you pay more for uh, green products, uh, even, if it, you know, even if it meant paying more out of pocket? Well, I agree with him if they make it more feasible, the prices and all where people can you know, think more into it. I think the cost of it is keeping a lot more people not involved more than we should be. So I agree with him on that. If they okay. 
Okay. I, I also agree. I, I think that uh, in order to for us to really, and I, I think also for more people to become more involved and more engaged in uh, becoming green and going green, um, companies need to also uh, uh, give consumers more uh, incentives or um, break down the prices or bring down the prices, uh, lower their prices rather, so that more people can become engaged and involved. So I think right. if companies would, would sort of come together and lower the prices and, 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 and get a handle on, on, on their prices, then, then um, things would move a little faster in terms of more people becoming green. Okay. When we return, we'll be joined by a panel of experts to further discuss how green is Louisiana. Welcome back to Louisiana Public Square. Tonight we're exploring the question, how green is Louisiana? Joining us now is our panel of experts. Stephen Murray has been Secretary of Louisiana Economic Development, or LED, since he was appointed by Governor Bobby Jindal in 2008. Among his achievements as LED Secretary is the recruitment of the first nuclear <laughs> module manufacturing facility in the U.S. to Louisiana. Jordan Maka is the Gulf States Representative for the Delta Chapter of the Sierra Club. In 2010, Jordan worked with the Louisiana Public Service Commission to adopt a renewable portfolio standard pilot program, the first in the Deep South. Chris Schmidt is a project manager in the Division of Economic Development and Forecasting at LSU's E.J. Orso College of Business. Chris is currently leading LSU's efforts to study the Louisiana and Mississippi green economies for Growing Green, a program in partnership with the Louisiana Workforce Commission and the state of Mississippi. Donna Curtis is Executive Director of Shreveport Green, a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the city's environment and economy through public education, community beautification, litter abatement, and recycling projects. She also serves on the board of the National Alliance for Community Trees. Let's start with a general question to our panelists. When it comes to being green, just how well is Louisiana doing? Stephen, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, I think it's hard to sort of say exactly how we're doing as a state, but I think where we can all agree is there's a big opportunity for Louisiana and a big opportunity uh, in the green space to create jobs. What we get excited about is as we look at the next 20 years for our state, potential uh, for job creation and renewable energy and green manufacturing job opportunities in Louisiana could create 50 to 60,000 new good jobs in our state. That's a big focus for the Department of Economic Development. Jordan. For, for the South and where we are, we are doing fantastic. Um, we've come a long way in the last three years. We have the Renewable Portfolio Standard. We're working on an energy efficiency docket. Um, we're, we have the best solar tax credit in the nation. I know our Sierra Club lobbyists across the country are all envious of what we've been doing down here. And so I think we're moving in a really good direction. Of course, there's more that we could be doing, but I think where we are right now is a great starting point and we should continue to keep moving forward. Chris, you've been doing a big scale study of uh, green jobs in Louisiana, Mississippi. How, how are we doing? Well, I agree with, uh, with both of my fellow panelists. I, I think there's a lot of opportunity and uh, we've come a long way in the last few years. But I also think there's, there's really a lot going on. Um, just in the past year, I've been, I've been surprised about how much is, is happening here. Um, it may not be the same type of green activities that are occurring in other states, but it's activities that build on our comparative advantages, um, such as uh, chemical manufacturing, uh, using uh, renewable bioproducts to produce chemicals. It's just one mm -hmm. example. So I think there's, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of opportunity to, to increase uh, green activity, green employment, and uh, recently a lot has been changing. And Donna, tell us about Shreveport Green and what's it th what, what you're doing in Shreveport. Well, I liked earlier in the show someone mentioned personal responsibility, and that's something we've been preaching for 20 years in Shreveport. Um, well, for 21 years, actually. I agree, obviously, with the rest of the panel. I think Louisiana is getting in a good time. I think we're strategically placed right now with our natural gas boom in North Louisiana, which is helping our economy tremendously up there. 
Um, we've recently gotten curbside recycling, which is um, a huge boon for that too, because it, it offers more of an opportunity to the people to do something the right way uh, before we just had drop off buyback centers. But um, Louisiana, I think as a state, we have so much to offer, so much more to offer, and so much the greener we can become and the more we can be helped by state credits like the solar energy credit, which is huge. I think that will be that that'll be perfect for Louisiana. I think we're strategically placed and ready to go. And I'm I'm proud of where we are right now, getting started. Okay. Wanda, you had a question and so I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, my question well actually I have two, but the first question is where exactly are we in terms of creating uh, clean energy jobs? Um, just exactly where are we and how do people go about um, um, uh, getting the information in terms of what type of clean energy jobs are out there or available? Christopher's probably the best in terms yeah, of the existing yeah. numbers. Well, that's, yeah. that's a large part of our project is uh, letting people know what types of jobs exist, clean energy jobs, as well as other jobs having to do with, with uh, green economic activity within the state. Um, so we want to let people know what kind of jobs exist, what kind of training opportunities exist, <coughs> and also have a, a job bank where they can go and actually apply for, for positions that are currently open. So where do they actually go to, to, to get this information? O online or well, uh, uh, where? Well, over the, over the next few months, they'll be able to go to uh, a website linked to the Louisiana Workforce Commission's main okay. webpage, homepage, okay. and uh, they'll be able to find all the information about the green economy through through that site. Okay, great. Thank you. And of course, our big focus at the Department of Economic Development is attracting more of those jobs uh, okay. in the future. And the good news is we've had some very significant success uh, recently. Uh, New Orleans, for example, we just attracted um, uh, an advanced um, high-tech uh, wind turbine uh, blade uh, manufacturer, mm -hmm. Blade Dynamics. Mm -hmm. Actually, a joint venture of a traditional chemical industry company, the Dow Chemical Company, uh, an American superconductor. They're going to be making the blades that go on the wind turbines all around the country. 600 new advanced manufacturers Wonderful. jobs right there in New Orleans. We're not going to be a major user of that technology. In fact, one of the things that I really wanted to share with the group today is that regardless of where the country goes and mm -hmm. which technologies are the winners, some of those will be successful in Louisiana, some of them won't, mm -hmm. but we're going to make the components for them. We're going to get the jobs right here in the state. That's great. You're going to see more of those advanced manufacturing opportunities in the future. Great. Thank you. Robert, you had a question about um, environmental professionals and, and how we get them to come to Louisiana. Yeah, earlier we were talking about personal green responsibility, but as a state and a nation, we're facing some very fundamental environmental challenges that, uh, you know, over the next 20 and 30 years, uh, particularly in South Louisiana and coastal Louisiana. Um, what is y'all's opinion about the role that environmental professionals are playing in these decisions? Do you think that we're relying on our, our, our professionals and our experts in academia, or do you think that Surprise, surprise, politics is playing a, too big a role in some of our decisions. Well, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll take on this question. Um, you know, I think the environmental movement definitely has a role to play in kind of how we're addressing the job issue. Um, politics definitely has lent a very big helping hand. You know, what we're talking about with job creation, with the solar tax credit, when that tax credit was issued, we have now over 300 solar companies in the state of Louisiana, and those are providing jobs to people, and it's created new uh, <coughs> mechanisms for training in our public <coughs> universities. And, you know, but we also need to make sure that, you know, these types of groups in terms of what environmental organizations are doing is we're helping to promote kind of what can be a green job, um, and coastal restoration, <coughs> Um, we're, you know, working with different industries on how can we make that more of reality, working with the core enge engineers, working with other agencies on how can we rebuild back some of the coast that we've lost. And so that's how kind of the environmental movement as well as politics can play a joint role. And just, just to add to that, if you look at industry and what their motivating factors are to sort of become more environmentally friendly, one of them certainly has been the regulatory you know, inputs out there. Yeah. But there's two other really growing uh, significant contributors as well. One of them is that there's a growing number of people in the country that are willing 
to pay a little bit more uh, for green products. Not everybody, but it's a growing group of people, whether it's uh, more efficient building materials, more efficient automobiles, and so forth. The other thing, though, is that companies obviously are major users of energy. Uh, and it's in their best interest to reduce their energy footprint as well. And so I think you see those three things working together to really create a greater focus on, on green energy and green technology. So do you consult with environmental professionals in, in trying to figure out the, the green angles to some of your day-to-day -day decisions? Well, most of the environmental um, regulatory regime that, that impacts industry in Louisiana really comes out of Washington, D.C. So it's really driven at the federal level the role of the Department of Environmental Quality really is to basically implement those federal laws in Louisiana and at the local level. Uh, so we don't have a big role in kind of the regulatory side of it. But what we're doing is really looking at where the direction of consumer interest is going, where the technologies are going, and specifically focus on the areas that are likely to create the most jobs. That's where we're focused and we're recruiting those companies to Louisiana. Right. Paul, you had some questions about cost. My, my, I'm going to stick on this and I'm going to ask it. You don't get mad? <laughs> <laughs> you got four of y'all up on the panel. I bet none of your houses have a solar panel on the roof, do they? How many of you got a solar panel on your roof? I don't own a house. <laughs> <laughs> you got out of that. You don't have a solar panel on the roof because you can't afford a solar panel on your roof. If you could afford it, you, it's not going to pay for it. it it's not, my, my whole deal is not economically feasible. You say it's a growing percentage. What's your definition of a growing percentage? 1%, 5%, 10%? It depends on the particular industry sector. Paul, I think your, your point is actually very well taken, but I think a couple things are happening that are influencing this. One is that some of the green technologies actually are becoming economically competitive. Now, they're not all there yet. You're absolutely very right. Solar is more very expensive. Very Wind is more expensive <laughs> today. But if you look at, I think one of the folks mentioned earlier, the, the concept of electric cars. Well, as soon as the battery technology reduces in cost by 75, 80 percent, which is going to happen probably in the next 10 to 15 years, you're going to see a lot more electric, you know, power <laughs> vehicles. But not electric car in the 1890s. We're in, the two, we're in 2011. 2011. Yeah. From the 1890s to 2011, that's a long, long time, time to improve battery technology. Yeah. But yes. how, how much of this is investing in the future versus current reward today? And you, can you can you strike that balance? Is, is I think there's a place for both. I mean, I think one of the things that's definitely happening over time is that many of the different green technologies, in fact, are becoming more and more economically competitive, and in fact, in some cases, less costly you know, than the alternative, and those things are going to naturally be successful. I think on the other side, there's a role you know, a targeted role in some places for state incentives like the solar panel incentive program, for example, I think to help kind of encourage the development of those things. Where we have to be really careful is to not hurt our existing energy industry. In Louisiana, that's a very important balance because it's our single most important driver of our economy. But as we look at the future, we see a future that's going to see many thousands of new jobs in traditional energy and many thousands of new jobs in green energy as well. We don't think it's necessarily a one or the other kind of thing. We think there's a balanced future that we can achieve. Sure. Aaron, you, um, Warren, you had a question about the greening of the economy. Do you want to? Well, following along um, the energy industry, um, and of course Louisiana's a producing state as well as a very high consumer of, use of energy in our industries. <coughs> um, so how, how might the transition towards a more diversified energy supply um, affect our state revenue and the way that we collect royalties from that industry? Well, I think that that's the key to the balance that I was really talking about is that when we look at the future of Louisiana's major industry sectors, the one traditional Louisiana industry that has tremendous growth potential is energy. You know, ultra deep water drilling, enhanced oil recovery, the natural gas opportunities like in northwest Louisiana. So we see tremendous growth there. At the same time, we see growth in, in renewable energy in Louisiana. If you look at our wood products industry, for example, for many years we've had plywood plants, paper mills, and so forth all over the state, but the, the total demand for those wood products has gone down dramatically. It's gone down about 60% in the last six years. So our timber industry has been under a lot of pressure statewide. Some of these new energy opportunities are biofuel refineries that use wood as the actual major input you know, to those facilities. So that's really a way to diversify our economy, take advantage of all that infrastructure, all the specialized workforce that we already have, and create new jobs in an area where we were losing jobs. That's just one example. There's several others like that. But I guess I've asked the question, you know, what's the cost of 
by mm -hmm. not starting to begin that transition. I mean, we're going to run out of fossil fuel eventually, um, particularly oil. We've just found the Hainesville Shale site, and um, that's natural gas has definitely been touted as the transition fuel away from oil. And in Louisiana, you know, we're losing a football field of wetlands every 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. And there are, you know, mm -hmm. scientific facts, you know, saying, showing that the oil and gas industry as well as CO2 input has caused sea level rise and has helped cause the deterioration of our wetlands. And we need to f strike some balance in that to, while acknowledge, yes, we're not going to be able to get off of fossil fuels overnight, but also how, but also begin the transition towards mm -hmm. and create incentives for alternative energy. I know this is going to sound crazy, but I would actually argue that you and Paul are both right. Because Paul's right that the, the alternative energy options simply don't create enough energy today, and certainly not economically enough today, to be a replacement for our traditional energy sources. But I think we're going to get there a lot faster than people realize. And I would tell you right now, it, in fact, one of the most interesting um, economic development opportunities that we're pursuing today is that we're cultivating major existing sort of traditional energy companies that are actually developing new alternative energy projects, like ExxonMobil, for example, putting millions of dollars into algae-based energy production. BP looking at biofuels-based uh, refineries that could potentially be developed in Louisiana. We're going to get there as fast as we can, but I think at the same time, we're going to continue to see additional, you know, retained jobs and lots of new jobs in traditional energy, too. And I think the future is going to be a balance of both of those. Chris, what, what, is your, what is the research showing about the future of green jobs? Well, one, one really interesting thing is it's, it's our workforce in these traditional energy industries that make Louisiana an attractive place for, for new renewable uh, energy industries, such as the, the hydrokinetic river turbines. One reason why Louisiana is good among, among several is we have a, a workforce that's used to working around, around the water. Um, so I think you know, we, we shouldn't be quick to, to do away with our traditional industries when they're really helping us to attract some of these new renewable energy ones. Uh, just to comment on that, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the workforce that we have here now is extremely talented mm -hmm. and bring a lot to further new types of industry for sure. And we just need to create the mechanism in the state as well within our universities, within our community colleges, within workforce training programs so that we can start making those investments in other forms of energy outside of the traditional that we're using right now. Wanda, you had a question. Well, my question, uh, other question was about um, the renewable energy uh, sources that we have. Um, and from the information that um, uh, I read through and that was given, um, it, it stated that we have, a, to me, a high percentage of renewable sources of energy, uh, about 70 percent. And my thought is, in having such a high percentage, that 70 percent, wh why have we not been using all of that, uh, all of those resources a long time ago? Or are we, <coughs> where are we right now in terms of the renewable energy sources that, of, the, of which that 70 percent that we have? I would say there's two reasons why you don't see more of it yet. Uh, one is that some of these technologies have just taken some time to mature. Okay. Uh, the other is that as our traditional energy sources, like gasoline that we're all paying almost $4 a gallon at the right. pump, become more expensive, it attracts a lot more investment into alternative <coughs> energy technologies that may not be as competitive at lower sort of traditional energy prices. Okay. So every time you see those gas prices go up, we don't want to see them go up, but when they do go up, it actually drives a lot of investment into these alternative energy technologies. So I would tell you that today, even though we see traditional energy still as the biggest growth driver in Louisiana in the next 20 years, the biggest uh, single source of new prospects that we're pursuing today, major job creation opportunities, are actually these kinds of alternative energy and renewable energy projects that we're talking about today. Okay. Biofuels refineries, hydrokinetic power using the Mississippi River, 
um, algae-based energy production. And, and, and in terms of those renewables, we're talking about not just wood, but also rice, corn, sugar cane, a variety of other crops that we already you know, <coughs> grow in Louisiana. Wood in particular, though, we've got this huge abundance of timber in our state that we're not really able to fully utilize right now. That's really the low-hanging fruit, where you're going to see, I think, opportunities to go in to communities in our state that maybe lost their paper mills, places like Bastrop or Pineville, okay. will be able to attract uh, wood-based biofuel refineries to those communities and create as many, if not more, jobs than they had before. It won't happen overnight, but I think it's a big opportunity in front of okay. us right I'm now. I'm going to change the topic just a little bit. Erin, you had a question about local recycling. Oh, I did, and, and so maybe Shreveport can uh, jump in here. Um, I, I'm actually glad to hear that Shreveport has curbside recycling because um, I, um, until I heard that, I thought Lafayette and Baton Rouge were the only places in the state that had curbside recycling, and I'm just wondering why so few places in the state take advantage of recycling programs? Why are, why are we seemingly so behind with something that, to me, seems very simple, just um, recycling in the state? I think there are <clears throat> two main reasons. One is economics. A curbside tree port has the Cadillac service. Single stream curbside recycling. Everything goes in one bin. They accept everything. Um, all plastics, paper, aluminum, metals, everything. Um, it all goes in one bin. It's very simple. It's very easy. It's, it's a no-brainer. On the other hand, it's costly. You need to have special trucks. We need to collect it separately. Fortunately, we've just gotten Pratt Paper Company, which is a recycled paper mill, and it, it's a MRF there also that accepts the, all the recyclables and, and divides them up and then markets them. So the expense is there, and Shreveport has recently had a $2.50 solid waste fee added. We've never paid a solid waste fee in Shreveport, which is, to me, that's kind of been in the back of my mind for 20 years, <laughs> why we don't have one. I can't find a place anywhere that does not have one. But ours comes out of the general fund, our waste, our solid waste um, garbage fee. We, we, don't, we don't pay one, but now we do. And it's been a little bit of a, of a discussion in Shreveport. But um, I, the majority of people, it's passed the city council, and the majority of people now are doing it. And I'm really glad we have it. Once all the kinks get worked out of collection and everything, it's, it's good for us. And I think that's it. It's an economic issue. Because it's the collecting that's expensive, and also then the selling of the things once they get it. Mm -hmm. Our paper mill in Shreveport, we take we have a 400 mile radius around Shreveport that we collect paper from Baton Rouge, Houston, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another really great example of what can be a new green industry in New Orleans right now. We have we're working on getting a curbside recycling program in place. The mayor has already dedicated, saying that we will have curbside recycling. Uh, it was supposed to go forward this month, but it's been pushed back to May due to some logistical um, mishaps. But we are, you know, really trying to incentivize how can we utilize these recycled products. And by more cities collecting it, that could in turn bring business down here that will utilize these types of recycled products. So it's a win-win on, you know, trying to develop, you know, Green, the green economy, but also greening your city and greening your home. Yep. One, oh, one example of a, of a new company coming to Louisiana that's using or reusing um, a product is Green Diamond Fuels in Norco, Louisiana. They'll produce biodiesel from um, restaurants' uh, waste grease. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's, that's a great example of, of how you know, we, can, we can attract businesses with some of our uh, recycled products. Donna, when you when you talk about Shreveport Green, how did you all make that happen? Make what the recycling? The, the recycling, yeah. yeah. Did well, we we cannot take all the credit, although we'd like to sometimes. <laughs> but it's we've done the education for 20 years, and we realized there was a cry in the wilderness 20 years ago when we were found, and that was one of the bases that um, the medical society and um, some other volunteers in the community came together to form Shreveport Green was to pursue recycling options in Shreveport and Caddo Parish, and to implement eventually um, a very clean, green community. And that's what we've worked for. We've done the education. We've talked to the people. We've worked with our administration at the, in the city. We've worked uh, very for fortunately. We had a real good partner in Pratt when they came to town. It was sort of a, a no-brainer, really, for us, because it was a wonderful facility, a clean facility. Uh, we don't have the fumes. 
you know, the emissions are low. It was a really good opportunity for us. So it was a win-win for us at that point. Um, but like I said, it's the education of the people that is most important. Um, and that's what we've done, working with the school children. We've done, someone asked earlier about the curriculum. We've done a, uh, a curriculum for, for years in the, in the, with, the, with the school system, teaching the young people, having cleanups, teaching about clean water, how litter, just litter can harm our waterways and, and um, be a real distraction to the community. And now, what did y'all do with the Christmas trees? <laughs> <laughs> this year, we have been so proud. We've sent eight to 15 mm. truckloads of gas-powered <laughs> trucks down the, <laughs> down the 49 <laughs> to the bayou, to Lafouche, down to Lafouche Parish to use for the wetlands restoration, oh. which has been very successful. We've even had a team of our young people that work with Shreveport Green, our Shreveport program, to follow them down and actually place them in the cribs. Oh. Uh, it was a wonderful learning process for us. It was a, the community has responded overwhelmingly to that. But this year, state funds were cut for that, so we had to go back to what we did the first year, which was using the Christmas trees for mulch. Mm -hmm. So we collected the trees and mulched them right there at a facility in Shreveport, and we've now used it in community projects all around the all around oh. the city and the parish. Mm -hmm. So we've been able to do that, and we've been uh, doing that for this was our 21st year. Paul, you had a Yes, the gentleman with the state, and I don't know if you know the answer. What percentage would you say of state automobiles currently run on natural gas? CNG. It's mm. a good question. Um, it's a small percentage. I mean, it's certainly. I don't. I don't want to speculate. It's certainly less than half. Probably less than five percent. I don't know the exact number. Don't you think the state wants to go green, and everybody wants to go green? What do you think? We well, actually, because natural I, gas is obviously no, no. It's clean. a it's a good question. Fle fleet vehicles, it, vehicles that would service like a local bus system, actually is a very economic case to use compressed natural that gas. Is. However, I'm however, many of the state of vehicles, like for example, my department probably has seven cars that we use to travel around the state. Well, uh, compressed nat natural gas is only viable if you can get filled up in all the different locations well, that you want to go. Yeah, and that's why, there's not a, that's why there's not a national network yeah. right now of compressed natural gas vehicles. But what you do see in places like Shreveport and other places around the country is that some communities are converting a large portion of their, of their kind of bus system or local service vehicles <coughs> to compressed natural well, gas. To me, if the government wants to get involved, give a tax credit, put in these compressed natural gas fill you know, Char we can fill up. Charles, you were trying to ask a question there. A comment on the lady from Shreveport. It took a generation or more for you to get one of those objectives. Yes. And I see that as the basic approach to the environmental movement. It's education and a cultural shift. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's almost like a religion for some people, mm -hmm. not the theological side of it, but it's a concern and people need to be taught. And when they're taught to believe that, then they'll practice it in the rest of their life. And as I see it, on the corporate side, it's either the carrot or the stick. You reward industry with tax breaks or other such things, or you in effect enforce their actions through regulations whether they like it or not. And when gas gets five dollars a gallon, there's going to be a lot of environmentalists. I think about that a lot. And, you know, then it's more than a religion. You get in your pocketbook and you quit preaching and started meddling to get in my wallet. But a lot of us are going to be serious environmentalists as the gas price goes up. I love that, your, your, your point on that, the cultural shift. And that's mm -hmm. what we were talking earlier back before we came out. In Shreveport, that's really happening. And interestingly enough, we're, we're interested, we've got a wonderful arts community as well as a wonderful environmental community. And we're trying to attract that creative group. And we have so many young people that have come back to Shreveport with all these wonderful ideas mm -hmm. and have really grown up with it. Mm -hmm. And that's really one of the exciting things going on in Shreveport right now. We've just converted, we are converting our buses, our sport tran tra public transportation to compressed gas vehicles. Mm -hmm. we have, we're using our, our uh, energy money that we got several years ago um, to, to 
trans to transform our garbage trucks. That's a huge emission mm -hmm. of uh, of fuel and and use of fuel. So up in the northwest corner of the state, we are we are taking the city has taken the lead in several uh, of those things, particularly. But I absolutely agree with you. It's the education, it's enforcement of some of the ordinances that are out there now <coughs> that have not really been enforced in the past. And then it's actually getting out and doing it, like doing cleanups, doing recycling drives, um, encouraging, doing water cleanups, doing water quality testing and, and talking to, using the, the school children to do that. That's a, those are things we're doing in Shreveport. Joy, you. Do you think that we have another 20 years to work on this? Because for 20 years or more, we've heard all of this, but in 20 years, are we going to be where we need to be? That's the question. I agree with Is you. that because I want it all done uh -huh. now. tomorrow? <laughs> yes. 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 Um, and it's it's absolutely twenty years seems awfully long, even to me right now. At my <laughs> <laughs> and being in this movement for twenty years, it it will tax you. But I agree, twenty years. It's I would like to time. think it would happen sooner than that no. um, <laughs> to, for us yeah. to be economic, and it's. It's coming very quickly in Shreveport now. Mm -hmm. That's what's been so amazing, amazing to all of us that have been working for so long at it. All of a sudden, we're, we're there, yeah. things are happening because every day, yeah. every couple of months. Something new's coming out. We heard all the news about the in uh, in New Orleans about making the 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 blade the um, wind Winter. blades. Mm. We're I mean. It just seems like there's a lot of good news in Louisiana, and we need to be proud of that, and we need to tell everybody so about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Let yeah. everybody know yeah. we're not the dumping ground anymore. Yeah. We're yeah. making yeah. headways environmentally. Of all the states, Louisiana ought to be leading it mm -hmm. with our wonderful natural resources. That needs to be some of the good news that we hear Absolutely. on the news. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Glenn, you look like you're ready to jump in. I, I wanted to just mention the fact that um, what we're really talking about here is one of our individual greatest uses of energy is in the automobiles that we drive. Um, and one of my big disappointments is that we don't really have much of an alternative here, especially in Baton Rouge. And I feel as part of local government's responsibility that when your gas prices go up to five and six dollars a gallon, that you have some alternative to using your automobile. And our public uh, transportation system here is, is just not suitable for it. No. We have um, bus stops that are not shaded uh, from the sun. Uh, you have uh, erratic schedules in the buses, and uh, I don't know of anyone who uses the, the bus system on a regular basis. And it would seem to me that we have a very big uh, student population yeah. between uh, LSU and Southern, mm -hmm. as well as uh, other young people who would benefit from the use of a bus, uh, and also uh, issues with uh, bicycle paths and walking paths mm -hmm. that are non-existent except for a few places. Yeah. And uh, I'm just wondering if anyone on the panel has any thoughts on how we could improve that or Absolutely. questions or comments about We're it. We're doing that right now. We've just started the natural gas buses in Shreveport and we've been talking with Sportran just in the last three months about redoing some of the bus stops. We've got some great new thinkers that are putting together and we've been uh, we're putting together plans to make the bus stops more amenable and that was exactly the point is that it needs a cultural shift to go away from our individual <coughs> transportation to from the car to bicycles make public ed, public transportation acceptable and acceptable and, yeah. and we're we're landscaping yeah, yeah. we're landscaping um, the bus bus stops we are making it we're putting up more shelters so they're protected but to make the ride more enjoyable and for years we did a litter survey, and the, the bus stops were the dirtiest places in Shreveport. We joined with Sportran, we put receptacles out, they empty it, the city helps in empty them, and we have cleaner bus stops now. So it, it all works together, but absolutely, we need an alternative. The city of Baton Rouge was recently awarded funding for four natural gas uh, dump trucks. Those are big, heavy-duty vehicles that will be fueled at the Department of Public Works CNG facility which is um, right north of the Capitol, and 
there's a group in Baton Rouge that I'm affiliated with called the Clean Cities Coalition, and we are one chapter of a Department of Energy program nationally that works to bring the infrastructure for fueling on natural gas or propane or biodiesel or ethanol, you name it, if it's an alternative, then there are programs across the country to get these projects developed, but we've got to form that partnership between the public funding and the the guys that are building the stations and then get it out there available we're, for all of us. We're going to have to let that be the last last word. Uh, we've run out of time for our question and answer segment. We want to thank our panelists, Secretary Moray, Ms. Maka, Mr. Schmidt, and Ms. Curtis. When we come back, I'll have a few closing comments. That's all the time we have for this edition of Louisiana Public Square. We encourage you to explore other ways the state is going green by attending Louisiana Earth Day, April the 17th in Baton Rouge. You can find more information about Earth Day as well as state energy efficiency incentive programs by visiting our website at lpb.org slash public square. While you're there, take this month's survey and share your thoughts on tonight's show. We want to hear from you like we did last month from Deborah and Joyce after our program, Redistricting Louisiana. Deborah writes, I'm hearing a lot about minority majority redistricting. I do not feel this should be an issue. Redistricting should be based on population. Joyce offers an opposing viewpoint. It is important to have representation with similar ideas, culture, and backgrounds. As a minority, one could feel as though gerrymandering could have adverse effects. Thanks to you both for commenting. LPB will continue to track the redistricting special session and keep you updated weekly on Louisiana, the state we're in. Join Public Square next month as we examine the challenges facing the regular legislative session in plugging the state's $1.6 billion shortfall on Budget Battle 2011. Thanks for watching and good night. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. Support for this program is provided by the men and women of the Louisiana Forestry Association. Through sustainable forestry, LFA members promote the health and productivity of Louisiana's forests for generations to come. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting.